Hello and welcome to Strange Pathways. I am your host, Scott Mort. I hope you're having a fantastic week. I'm having an interesting one. <laughs> it, it looks as though I may have to start looking for a new job. So, so frustrating. I'm still working at my old job. But it's unfortunately coming to an end. I'm, I'm going to play it out for as long as I can, but a lot of this weekend was spent really just searching for a new job. So, if you're so inclined, some good thoughts, prayers, vibes, what have you, send them out towards me. I could use them right now. Also, a, a little call to action. If any of our listeners happen to be near Newton, Utah, I'm doing some research on on something that happened there in 1978 that I am I'm coming to dead end after dead end after dead end. To give the broad strokes of the case, 1978, uh, farmer Terry Lopi, and that's L O P I. He, he goes on a trip to gather groceries and feed for his animals. He comes back. About an hour later, one of his two barns is missing. The entire barn. Uh, there was dirt surrounding where the foundation of the barn had been. Nothing else. Just the dirt left behind. If anybody has more information on the Terry Lopi case, please get in contact with me, strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Our first case is going to take us all the way back to January of 1974 in South Australia, Clifton Bore, South Australia. More, more precisely, Sturt's Stony Desert. Now, we're kind of going out there. We look out the road, and we see a car being driven down. In the car, Ben. That's all he's going by, Ben. He's 38 years old, and he's got a female friend with him. Ben's a rock hound. In particular, he's looking for fossils. The woman kind of unfamiliar with the area so Ben parks the car where he's going to go fossil hunting and he tells the woman please stay here you you don't know you don't know the area like I do I don't want you to get hurt I don't want you to get bit by any of the snakes that are obviously out here it's Australia need I say more just stay with the car and I'll be back soon. So he goes out and he searches. He gets about two kilometers away. And he's, he's approached by these two creatures. Now, they're human looking. They have short hair. They're, their heads are kind of elongated at the rear but they're only about one meter in height. Also, their, their arms are very, very short in comparison with the rest of their body. Whenever these creatures speak to him, it's rapid fire. It, it sounds like a tape recorder that's broken and the motor is just going out of control. They're, they're wearing these silver suits, and, and this guy cannot understand a word that these creatures are saying. So, these creatures, knowing that Ben can't understand them, they beckon him. They take their hands, and they make the, the come here motion. After Ben follows these creatures, they come to this silver-collared craft. Ben says it's, it's kind of shaped like a hot dog bun. It's about eight meters long, two meters high. 
they didn't travel that far to get to the craft, though. Ben can't understand how he didn't notice this before. It, it should have been very visible to him. It almost reminds me, there's, there's a Douglas Adams book. It's one of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books where they, they cloak crafts using what is humorously called a somebody else's problem field. You don't have to notice this. This is somebody else's problem. These beings, they go to an opening in the craft. And once again, they turn around. And they kind of motion for him to come in. It's... Opening is so small. Ben has to bend down to get inside. But whenever he does get inside, in a very Doctor Who-like twist, it's bigger on the inside. It's actually quite vast. Inside of this object, there are many, many other variations of this being walking around. Some of them female. One of these creatures walks up to Ben, hands him a drink. Ben's psyche is pushed to the limit, and he is, he is terrified. He is too scared to refuse this drink. He takes the drink, he puts it up to his lips, swallows it, and passes out. Sometime later, Ben comes to. He's lying on the floor. And the two beings that ushered him into the craft, they're still with him. They don't talk to him. They don't psychically project to him. But he gets the feeling, Ben gets this feeling that he can't shake that he's been rejected. He's been ignored. He does not, for whatever reason, fulfill the purpose that these creatures have for him. He stands up. And when he does, Ben sees something absolutely chilling. In front of Ben, there are these things. They're like cages, but not quite cages. Inside of these cages are two human girls. Nine, twelve years old. They're dressed normally. They seem to be in some sort of trance. But they are in this cage. What do you do? There's nothing you can do. The doorway appears again. Ben steps out. Maybe, maybe this was the test. Maybe Ben is rejected because he didn't do anything to save the two girls. Or, perhaps if he was accepted, he would have ended up in the cages. I honestly believe he was rejected because he did nothing to save the two girls. And... I know what you're thinking, Scott, that happened after the feeling of rejection. Do you think these creatures who are able to manipulate perception, manipulate space in such a way that things are, like the TARDIS, bigger on the inside, 
do you think that they wouldn't know a choice that you were going to make before you made it? I know the experiment itself is somewhat controversial, but the Libet experiment done by Benjamin Libet in the 1980s, it, it shows that any decision we make, it, it builds up maybe half a second before we do it, half a second that we can measure. It it's probably much, much further back than that. The science that these beings had, it wouldn't surprise me that they could map out a mind, that they would know what decisions you would make before you made them. A little side note here. I wonder if the civilization that these entities come from if what they're doing is a big secret in their civilization, much the same way that supposedly there's a secret space program going on with our civilization, I don't know what to think of that. I don't know whether I believe that or not. But maybe there are planets out there where the alien greys just live their lives peacefully and, and there's this group... There's this cabal who whisk off to Earth, unknowns to the other greys, to do experiments on us. Just a little thought. Back to this tale, Ben finds himself out in the desert again. And what do you do? You just walk back to the car. Back at the car, he finds his friend. She's a little upset. An hour and a half has gone by. Needless to say, Ben is very, very unsettled by this experience. I think any of us would be. The, the desire to protect the youngest of us, children babies it runs very very strong in our genetics and when you fail to do that you feel like you fail humanity our next tale is going to take us back to the mid 1960s where we meet one Theodore Judd Sirios Ted. Ted Sirios. He was born November 27th, 1918. And he's not really a man that you want to be friends with. He is a drunk. He exhibits no self-control. He throws tantrums. He'll, he'll bang his head on the floor when things are not going his way. One of the people closest to him called him psychopathic and sociopathic. Ted has been arrested many times. He, he is not a person you want to be friends with. This is the kind of person that would pat you on the back, steal your car, drink heavily, and wrap that car around a telephone pole. The man has a lot of demons to fight. Ted was a Chicago bellhop, operated an elevator in a hotel, and he begins to experiment with hypnosis. And then he finds something odd. He finds that he can produce images onto film with his mind. Something he calls photography. He, he shows off to a bunch of people. 
and he gets the attention of a psychiatrist and psychical researcher, Jewel Eisenbud. Eisenbud and Sirius work together from May of 1964 until June of 1967, over three years. Thousands of trials, hundreds of different observers, scientists, academics, professional magicians. Over 1,000 strange photographs come from the mind of Sirius. If you go to the library at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. The entire collection resides in the special collection section of that library. You can read a book about it too, The World of Ted Sirios by Jewel Eisenbud. Now the way, the way Sirios would do this he had, he had what he called a gizmo. Normally, he made that gizmo under the supervision of scientists. A lot of times, these scientists actually had Ted Sirios wear clothes that they provided for him so that, that like slides and what have you couldn't be snuck in. He would take a little paper tube. Like I said, he would usually make it right then and there. He usually used the black paper that the, the film that they would use was, was wrapped up in. A solid black piece of paper to help fight light contamination on the film. He would take this black piece of paper, curl it up into a tube. With his right hand... He would hold that tube up to the lens of the camera. He would hold his left hand up. Intensely focusing. And then he would usually scream, yell, do something, and bring that left hand down. That was the signal to snap the photo. Not every shot produce something. This wasn't 100% repeatable. Not a lot of things are if you really think about it. I can, I can flip a coin and get a heads, but I can't do it every time. That's well within my power. But I can't do it every single time. But on the times that it did work, Blurry, but translatable images would appear on the film. A biplane. But interestingly enough, the inverted V-shaped mechanism on the biplane would be unverted. Different than what it actually was. The wrong number of windows on a targeted house, misspellings on words printed on the side of buildings. Which to me is fascinating. To me, like misspelling a word on the side of a building when in reality that word is spelled correctly on the side of the building that exists in what we call reality kind of lends a weird sort of credence to it, doesn't it? And you know what? The targets didn't always work out. There was, a, there was one time where the photo that they got out of Ted wasn't what they wanted, but was kind of what Ted was obsessing about at the time. The, the target was a photo of the French Chateau, Matignon. Ted's in a room about 30 feet away. 
but he just does not care. What's on Ted's mind? The spacecraft Mariner 4. It's landing on Mars. What does the photo that they get show? A bottle-shaped object, which looks a whole lot like the shape of the Mariner 4 spacecraft. Not only did Ted produce images, sometimes what would happen were images called the, the, the Ted called blackies and whiteies. Blackies were just black photos. Whiteies, white photos. Now, the blacked photos, there's no reason to think that, that light was ever prevented from reaching the film. Something should have appeared on that Polaroid film. Even if it was just Ted Serio screaming at the camera, something should have appeared. The white photos? Once again, if the light sources are blocked, those Polaroids should have been dark. In 1967, June, productivity kind of ended. Ted, for, for Eisenbud, produces an image of curtains. Eisenbud soon realizes what this means. The curtains come down. The end of the show. The curtain has fallen. From this point on, Ted, every once in a while, does blackies, whiteies, but loses the ability to produce objects on film. A lot of the skeptics will say he hid slides inside of his gizmo. And I do get that that is a possibility. But. Sirius produced 36 images. Where he was separated from the camera. From anywhere between one foot and 66 feet. That's under controlled conditions. There's 12 occasions, 9 different locations, 14 witnesses. It's, it doesn't have any credibility that the hidden image in a gizmo theory is true. There's no, there's no credibility to it at all. It's, it's frustrating. Because so many people see the Ted Sirius case and go, oh, it's an out-and-out -out fraud. Obviously, he's got something hidden in there. No. No. They haven't looked into it deep enough. Eisenbud and his associates, they tried to duplicate Sirius' powers by making their own gizmos, putting, putting slides, transparencies inside the gizmos. They couldn't do it. They weren't trying to hide. They were trying to replicate a fraud and they couldn't do it. There, there have been cases where Ted is separated from the camera and placed into an electrically shielded Faraday cage. And like I said, a lot of Ted's images were distorted. 
misspelled words, machinery assembled wrong. If you want to see a couple of Ted Sirius's photos, I'll make sure to put some up on the Strange Pathways Facebook page, along with a few other photos pertaining to today's cases. One, one interesting time that Ted Sirius was doing this, Eisenbud wanted Ted Sirius to produce an image of Eisenbud's property. He owned a ranch house, a barn. So, Ted does it. It doesn't resemble Eisenbud's barn and house now. But, it did resemble the way that it looked years, years before Ted had even seen it. In the late 1960s, Ted Sirios was getting a lot of attention. Magician, skeptic, debunker, James Randi goes on the Today television program. Randi, of course, being Randi, he insists that the phenomena is fake. More so, he boasts, I can do it. I can do it in conditions similar to those in which Ciro succeeded. Now remember, clothing supplied by the experimenters, separated from the camera, sometimes in another room. Heck, put James Randi in a Faraday cage. Why not? Randy appears on the Today Show with Eisenbud and accepts Eisenbud's challenge to duplicate what Ted Sirios can do. James Randy had already debunked a lot of fraudulent claims. And that's all it took. That is all it took. For a lot of people to believe that Ted Sirios was a fraud. But I'm going to tell you. Today, you're going to learn what the TV audience never learned. When that show was over and James Randi was pressed to make good on his word... He wriggled out of it. He never, never tried to duplicate what Sirios did. Never. Randy said, he, he responded in a letter dated October 8th, 1967, that it would be impossible to arrange a demonstration because uh, there's no chance of agreeing on the meaning of the terms, range of phenomena, and similar conditions. His words, not mine. Eisenbud gets back to Randy. And he says, he says to him, it's not going to be necessary to, to mimic everything Ted does. In his own words, it would be sufficient if you managed to duplicate the results obtained in two or three clear, well-defined, and well-documented experiments with TED. We need not, moreover, get hung up over what constitutes similar conditions. It would be sufficient if you used the identical physical setups as TED with either the same observers, in the following suggested experiments a total of ten, all hard-boiled skeptics or observers of equivalent background and training. The conditions of control of camera and film would merely have to be the same as those used with Ted. That is, with marked and initial cameras and film under the surveillance of one or more of the observers. Eisenbud made the rules very clear. They were the same rules that they had done with Ted. 
be stripped. Dress in our own clothes. Seal yourself in this room. If you choose to use a gizmo, the little rolled cardboard tube used by Ted, then we're going to look through that gizmo right before and right after the photo is taken to make sure you haven't hidden something in there. Randy, like Ted, would have to allow himself to be stripped and searched, including a thorough inspection of body orifices. Eisenbud, with a little sense of humor, also proposed that Randy be as drunk as Sirius throughout the trial. He kind of let that one go. He, he waved the whole alcohol thing, saying that Randy could not possibly drink as much as Ted. In later letters, Randy tried changing the subject from whether he could do it to whether Sirius could actually do it. Again and again and again, Randy sidestepped the challenge. Which to me is immoral and disgusting. If you're calling somebody a fake, if you're saying that you can do what they can do through fraudulent means and then can't, well then, two things. You need to man up and apologize to that person. And then you're going to have to admit that something more is going on. Ted Sirios lived to the age of 88. He died on a Saturday, December 30th, 2006. In Quincy, Illinois. One has to wonder if there are others out there who can do what Ted Sirios seemed to be able to do. But it's just not worth the trouble of showing anyone. Our last tale takes us back to September 15th, 1977, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We're going to meet a 33-year-old bus driver, Antonio La Rubia. Antonio, he's a creature of habit. You can count on him waking up at 2 in the morning, brushes his teeth, washes Leaves his home around 2.15, 2.20. Between Antonio and work is a large field. Today, he's walking through that field. He gets near the corner of it. And he sees an object. It's, it's around 235 feet across. It's a dull lead color, and it's shaped like a hat. It seems to be resting on the ground, but in reality, it's floating just a little bit above it. Because a search later shows that there's, there's no impression, no burned grass, nothing like that. La Rubia does the correct thing. LaRubia turns around and runs back home. The moment he decides to retreat, a bright light floods the area.
LaRubia sees three robots near him. They're about four feet tall. They have antenna that come out of the tops of their heads. And the antenna, that's not part of the four feet. The antenna extends beyond LaRubia's height. He's five foot five inches. And that's my height. I feel you, buddy. He said the heads of these creatures are football shaped. American football. There's a band extending across the middle. And there are rows of small mirrors of a blue shade. One is just a little darker than the others. The bodies of these robots, they're stocky. The trunk is broader than Antonio's. He's muscular, but slender. The arms of these things, they're like elephant's trunks, which narrow down to pointed tips. And each one of them has like a little robotic finger on the end of it. Covering their bodies is this substance. It reminds La Rubia of scales. Now, he didn't think these scales were armor. He said these robots moved around freely, and the scales don't seem to hinder their movements at all. The trunks round down at the bottom and extend into a single leg. At first, Antonio thinks that they're sitting on something, but then he realizes this is a leg. It's a leg that ends in a platform that's the size and shape of a saucer. Their bodies look like a dull shade of aluminum. He sees these robots. He realizes he can't move. He, he starts to flail around. And he feels like he's imprisoned inside of a jar. Like a giant bell jar. These creatures are just floating along. One of them looks like it's holding a syringe. Now, now this robot raises its arm, points the syringe at LaRubia. LaRubia moves towards it without feeling it. He enters the craft. He doesn't know how he entered it. He just enters it. He feels a tremor and then finds himself in this corridor. Two of the robots go one way. One of the robots goes another. He looks down the corridor and sees the field he just came from. The skin of the UFO is transparent. The craft lifts from the ground. Antonio feels like he's moving from south to north. He finds himself in a large circular room. The light in the room, it's like it's coming from the ceiling and becomes lighter as it comes down the wall until it blends in with the color of the walls. In this chamber, Antonio sees a dozen of these robots. To his left, and another dozen to his right. He's been struggling this whole time, but he can't make a sound. But then all of a sudden, he can. He screams, what do you want? Who are you? That's when all of these robots fall on the floor. This light comes on strong again. It blinds him. Antonio continues to struggle. It's not just out of fear and 
and a desire to be free. It's also because he's having trouble breathing. Antonio kind of realizes he can hear the robots breathing. It, it, it's puzzling him because he's assuming these are mechanical beings. Why would they need to breathe? All of these robots lying on the ground, they raise their arms up to the tip of the antennae. They're holding them. It's at this point Antonio realizes these antennae have been spinning so fast that he couldn't really make out what their shape were. When they held them, he could see that these antennae, they, they look like a teaspoon. The only other thing in this room besides Antonio and the robots is... A thing that he called a small piano. This box. It's about six inches wide. It's standing on two poles. It comes up to about Antonio's chest. On each side of the box, there were antennae jutting up. To one side... Keys reminded Antonio of a piano. There was something also that looked like a tin can on it. Uh, the, these robots were putting things in this tin can that they took from their belts. The, these belts that the robots wore, they were uh, devices, syringes, what have you, they would take a syringe, they'd insert it into the box, and then an image would appear on the wall of the UFO, showing a different scene. The images, Antonio, Antonio remembers the images. One of them was himself, nude, lying on an invisible table, swinging his arms about. There was another one, Antonio naked standing. A third picture of Antonio dressed, carrying a shopping bag, with his teeth chattering, looking nervous. A picture of a horse and cart being drawn over a dirt road. A light orange ball with Antonio standing beside it. Another picture of the ball, but this time it's, it's blue with the being standing beside of it. This one, this one, a little hard to describe. A dog was shown trying to get at one of these beings. But also shown in the picture, the dog was big, slobbering at the mouth, trying hard to get at the robot, looking really angry. The dog gives out four or five barks. And at this point, the robot starts to melt from top to bottom. The next photo, a factory, one of their factories where their crafts are manufactured. The scene is white, stretched out. There are three rows of UFOs. Two on the right were almost done. The one on the left was kind of in like just a, a skeleton stage. There were millions of robots walking around these craft, but no tools that Antonio could see. The ninth picture showed a train. The tenth picture showed an avenue jammed with cars. And then another photo of Antonio, naked. but then dressed, vomiting, and passing fecal matter into his trousers. One of these beings comes over 
to Antonio at the center of the Great Hall. Takes one of the syringes from his belt and passes it over to his left arm. In the robot's left arm, this, this syringe starts to rotate so fast that Antonio can't follow it with his eyes. Antonio's arm lifts against his will and the syringe is stuck into the middle finger of his right hand and it fills with blood. At this point, the robot takes the blood and draws a picture on the wall. He draws three circles and then intersects them with an L-shaped mark. And then boom. Antonio finds himself outside. He looks at his watch. 2.20 a.m. He looks up and sees what looks like the bottom of a dark, smooth balloon. And it just keeps going up and up and up until he can no longer see it. Antonio goes over to the bus station finds out the time is actually 2.55 a.m. He arrives to work on time. He feels ill. Mm, let's do that again. Antonio feels ill, nervous, aches all over. But he mans up. He drives the bus, even though his vision darkened at times. He works all day. Again, all day on Friday. He goes home. He goes to bed. Antonio tells nothing to anyone. Not even his wife. All the pictures that he, he's been shown seem to have been coming true in one way or another. Like his bowels are loose. He feels miserable. Saturday... He's, he's still ill. He misses work. Sunday, the same. He, he just can't work. His wife rubs him with alcohol. And that kind of relieves his muscles a little bit. On Monday, Antonio goes back to the bus company. He, he's difficulty breathing. He's burning. He's itching. He's going to quit. It gets so bad, he asks a workmate of his to hose him down with water. This lasts for 33 days. He is sick for 33 days. The bus company, to their credit, they want to help him. They bring the company nurse over, and she goes, I, I, I want to give you a tranquilizer. He sees the syringe, and it sets off his PTSD. He is terrified. They have to bring in ropes to hold him down. And they take him to the hospital because he's babbling about UFOs. Antonio gets to the hospital and the doctors go despite he's sick and he's babbling about UFOs he's normal he's, he, he was running a high fever about 103 that's a dangerously high fever. It's not 106. 106 was the real danger zone, but 103 is not good. But he's declared sane. He, it, it takes him so long to recover. I don't know what happened to Antonio LaRubia after this. I wasn't able to find anything about his life beyond this. I hope he had a good life. I hope he was able to recover from this. I somehow doubt it. 
Thank you for joining us again on this week's Strange Pathways. Please head over to our Facebook page. I'm going to have a, a series of images posted up there, some photos pertaining to the cases we talked about here today. If you'd like to get in contact with me, please do so at strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Huge, huge thank you going out to everybody out there who has been just pushing the podcast, telling their friends, telling their family members. You know what? Come on over to YouTube, leave a comment, hit like, hit subscribe. I love seeing that subscriber count go up. Hit it does my heart good knowing that this information is getting out there. I do want to take a moment and uh, just throw out a suggestion. If you have some time, head on over to Spotify and check out the podcast Nightmare Potluck. I had a chance to listen to a few episodes, really enjoyed it. Go over there, give those guys some love. And while you're at it, you know what? Turn to that special somebody in your life, your family member, a friend, a mentor, and just tell them that you love them too. Take care of yourselves and each other.